back to Just Energy Radio with Dr. Rita Louise. Hello and welcome back to Tech Just Energy Radio and thank you for staying tuned to the second hour of the show. Don't forget, Just Energy Radio is brought to you by SoulHealer.com and the Institute of Applied Energetics, where you can be, learn to become a medical intuitive, intuitive counselor, or energy medicine practitioner. And please do go to the Just Energy Radio website and sign up for our weekly newsletter to keep you informed of the programming we have coming up. You can also access our over five years' worth of archives with excellent programming like you're hearing today. So let me tell you a little bit about our next guest and get him on the air. Uh, Chris Carter received his undergraduate and master's degrees from the University of Oxford. The author of Science and the Near-Death Experience, Carter is originally from Canada, Canada and currently teaches internationally. So please welcome to Just Energy Radio, the author of the new book, Science and Psychic Phenomena, The Fall of the House of Skeptics, Chris Carter. Hey, Chris, how are you? I'm fine, Rita. How are you? I am great. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's a pleasure having you here to talk about one of my favorite topics, psychic phenomena. Um, let, let's start here. How did you become interested in psychic phenomena or the near-death experience or maybe you know things that are not – that fall outside of the traditional sciences. Right. Well, I've always been interested in controversial issues. Uh, even as a child, I was interested, in a childish way, of course, um, about in controversial issues. So, well, when I was a student uh, studying philosophy and economics, um, I came across various materialist theories, which seemed to be supported by most uh, most philosophers. But I also knew that there was this whole category of human experiences which were difficult to explain under any sort of philosophy of materialism. Uh, in my second year, I also lived on the outskirts of town in an ancient farmhouse owned by my college. This farmhouse was, I'm not sure, perhaps four or five hundred years old, and it was reputed to be haunted. Well, uh, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to move in there, my friend's told me about the, these stories, and I thought, well, this could be an interesting year. The stories weren't scary or frightening or anything. Um, and we did have some strange experiences, which I'd rather not discuss in detail, because it's just making myself a target. But uh, when I got back, when I graduated, I started, uh, in my spare time, I did a bit of reading on the subject, uh, not just on, well, on parapsychology and telepathy and so forth. And... Uh, but I was also aware that uh, so, some scientists and philosophers very vehemently denied the existence of such powers. And so I, I started uh, to investigate the controversy itself. But I suppose what really worked as a catalyst in getting me to write Science and Psychic Phenomena and uh, the other books in the trilogy was an argument that I had one day with a very stubborn, dogmatic skeptic uh, frankly, I was shocked by his ignorance and by the crudity of his arguments. But I also realized that his opinions were quite common among a substantial minority of scientists and philosophers, or a substantial minority of educated people. And so I decided that a book was needed to examine the evidence without prejudice one way or the other. But that's great. I mean, one of the things that I enjoyed about your book was that it it presented the information and it wasn't, well, you know, I had this experience which, you know, is valid. You know, having firsthand experience, you can't negate someone's experience. But yours really looked at more of the scientific part of investigating the experience, which I don't think a lot of people realize that there are real incredible people looking into this phenomena. Yes, and there have been for decades. I mean, Joseph Banks Ryan was one of the first uh, American parapsychologists to um, investigate these things experimentally. And in my book, Science and Psychic Phenomena, I actually quote some skeptics from the 1950s who were who wrote uh, that uh, if this were any other field of inquiry, the question would be over. There would be no debate. 
but uh, parapsychology is not like any other field of inquiry. The data of parapsychology challenge deeply held worldviews, worldviews that have to do with philosophy and religion, just as much as they have to do with, uh, with science. And as such, the data of parapsychology arouse strong passions in many people and a strong desire to dismiss the data that challenges their preconceived ideas of how the world works. I think your statement is interesting that it challenges worldviews. My observation is it really only challenges the Western worldview. Because um, <laughs> yeah, I, I would partly agree with that. It's it's this controversy is unique to the West, and people in other cultures, including scientists and philosophers in other cultures, are sometimes shocked by uh, the vehemence with which um, some Westerners deny the existence of these abilities, the passion that uh, that they bring to bear on this issue. Um, you're right. It's primarily Western. It grows out of the historical conflict in the West between science and religion. Science had to struggle in order to escape from the fetters of uh, of religion back in during the Renaissance. But um, yeah, it's a substantial. It's a. I, 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 but on the other hand, I do think it's a minority position. Uh, I mentioned surveys, two surveys in my book. Um, which found that a majority of scientists surveyed considered extrasensory perception either a likely possibility or an established fact. Um, yeah, so um, it's actually only a minority position within uh, within the scientific world. You don't live in the South. <laughs> I, all right, we're not, I'm not talking about the scientific position. I'm talking about the people position, where it's like, ah, that can't be true. You're going to burn in hell for that one. Um, with that said, and I'm just going to move along, um, it just seems like psychic abilities um, have been seen in the past or in traditional cultures um, as just a natural part of the ancient world. From a historical perspective, I mean, you've so we're kind of touched on this. When did all of this change and controversy really begin to ensue with it? It was during the so-called Enlightenment, which can be thought of as the ideological aftermath of the scientific revolution. The scientific revolution, of course, was due to men such as Galileo, Johannes Kepler, and, of course, Isaac Newton. And uh, uh, Galileo, Kepler, and Newton were not materialists. They were very much men of their times. Um, one of the reasons why Galileo recanted his views is because he was threatened with excommunication by the church. Uh, Kepler, in his youth, studied to be a Lutheran minister. Um, Isaac Newton spent the last half of his life writing books on theology. And so these men were not materialists, but uh, the the writers of the so-called Enlightenment were the so-called Fren the French philosophs, men such as uh, Voltaire and Diderot. These people were writing after the time of Isaac Newton. They were dazzled by the success of Newtonian physics with its uh, mechanism and its determinism. And they wanted to use the success of the new physics to argue against the authority of church of the church and uh, to argue against superstition. Because you have to remember, when these fellows were writing, which was the 1700s, um, memories of the Inquisition and the wars of religion were still fresh in people's minds. They had lived through some really terrible times. And so they thought that they could use the, uh, the, the philosophical implications of Newtonian physics uh, to argue against the authority of the church, to argue against um, some of the superstitions of the time, even though Newton himself did not endorse uh, any sort of materialist philosophy. But it was thought for an awful long time that physics provided reasons, to, reasons in support of the ancient doctrine of materialism, in which mind plays no causal role in nature. And so... It's really this ancient philosophy of materialism which is supported by the uh, or endorsed by the uh, today's so-called skeptics. 
you know, I find it interesting that this comes out and out of and because of the Newtonian uh, physics, because Newton was a known alchemist and a Kabbalist and was very into the arcane sciences, which, you know, based on this other worldview, would be evil. Yeah, well, as I said before, um, many people, including the French philosophers, have assumed that the physics of Isaac Newton supports the ancient doctrine of materialism, which goes back to the ancient Greeks and basically says that all things have a material cause, and the mind at most is this sort of useless byproduct produced by the brain. Newton himself did not endorse that view. He followed the dualism of René Descartes, and both Descartes and Newton argued that human beings were the sole exception in an otherwise deterministic universe. And I said before, it was really those people with an ideological agenda, anti-religious, anti-superstitious, the French philosophes who, who uh, used Newtonian physics to argue against uh, any sort of intervention of mind and nature, whether it's, uh, whether it's human or divine. And uh, the um, direct descendants of the philosophes are today's organized skeptics, the secular humanists. There's a close connection, which most people don't realize, between the ideology of secular humanism and the so-called skeptical movement. The world's largest skeptical organization is the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, or PSYCOP. They recently changed their name to CSI, Committee for Skeptical Investigation. But they were founded in 1976 at a meeting of the American Humanist Association by atheist philosopher Paul Kurtz. And they started off as uh, criticizing astrology and, uh, and they lumped in you know, psychic research and parapsychology all in the same boat. And uh, so yeah, it's essentially, I think it's important to realize that most of these so-called skeptics are militant atheists and secular humanists. So, and, and, and I'm not sure my listeners are familiar with the term humanist. Could you kind of explain that a little bit so that they can understand, you know, what their viewpoint is or what their whole deal is? The humanists are those people who believe that. Um, they classify beliefs into natural and supernatural, and they believe that uh, there is no such thing as a supernatural. There is only natural explanations. They believe that religious belief is, for the most part, harmful. Um, they think that they don't believe in any superstitions at all. Um, so they're people with an anti-religious and anti-superstitious agenda. They're often people who started off as religious fundamentalists and uh, who turned against it when they got older for whatever reason. Um, or they're people who perhaps had religion forced down their throat with their, when they were children, what have you. I don't really want to get into their personal motivations. Right. Because I can't speak for all of them. But they're, you know, they have, there's the American Human Association. They're, they're found all over the Western world. And as I said before, these are people that have an agenda, and their philosophy or their ideology is founded in large part on the doctrine of materialism, which I described earlier. Mm -hmm. And they realize, quite correctly, that if they were to accept the existence of psychic abilities such as telepathy or of the near-death experience as a genuine separation of mind from matter, then materialism would be proven false. And this pillar of their opposition to religion and superstition would therefore crumble. And this, in my opinion, explains more than anything else their opposition to psychical research. It almost seems like they have some political desire in this whole thing, but I can't really even make a connection of why having a belief in a materialistic world would have an impact on anybody. You know, did that make sense? 
Well, as I said earlier, the, most of these these so-called skeptics, and I can explain why I call them so-called skeptics, but most of these so-called skeptics are militant atheists and secular humanists. People like uh, the biologist Richard Dawkins, you know, who writes books like he wrote a book called The God Delusion, and um, yeah, and Dawkins uh, categorically rejects uh, any evidence for psychic phenomena. He just doesn't want to talk about it. He tries to he tries to ignore it. When he can't ignore it, he dismisses it. And when these skeptics can't dismiss the evidence, they try to suppress it. And in psych- science and psychic phenomena, I list several examples of uh, these so-called skeptics attempting to suppress uh, suppress the evidence. So, yeah, I do think these people are, to some extent, emotionally driven, definitely ideologically driven. Mm-hmm. Um, in your research, and I, I know you've done a ton, which is one of the things I really appreciate. What kind of clinical evidence has been found to support psychic phenomena? Uh, you mean experimental evidence? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, as I said earlier, I think the experimental evidence was solid as far back as the 1950s due to the work of people such as Joseph Banks Ryan. But today, uh, the data is even better. We have the modern computerized Gansfeld telepathy experiments, which have provided results, uh, impressive results with odds against chance of million to one. The Gansfeld telepathy experiments have been conducted by various researchers in different laboratories in different cultures and uh, has led to a lot of pos- positive results. And there's a variety of other successful and replicated experiments as well. Uh, For instance, the biologist Rupert Sheldrake, who wrote the foreword to my book, has done experiments with telephone telepathy in order to test the common claim that people can sometimes tell who's calling them on the phone before they even answer the phone. Um, In September 2006, Sheldrake presented a paper on telephone telepathy at the annual festival of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. And the results from his controlled experiments showed that people could, before answering the phone, correctly identify who was calling from a choice of four people over 40% of the time when we would expect a success rate of 25% by chance alone. You know, I, I find those experiments interesting um, in two ways. One, because somebody's doing them. But I always felt kind of disappointed, and I, I don't know why, that the success rate or the hit rate always just seems so low. I mean, yeah, it's more than the calculated chance rate, but it just seems like it should be higher. I don't know. Well, 40% over 25% is, you know, a substantial improvement. Well, no, but just higher. You know, 70%. I like 70 You know, that's a passing grade. I don't know. I just felt like it should always be higher. Let me ask a different question. So when they do these experiments, are they doing them with just regular people? Are they doing them with people who have, and I'll say, claim psychic abilities? What kind of um, individuals are the ones that are being the test subjects? For the most part, it's ordinary people, such as college students that they've recruited for the experiment. But uh, they also have done some Gansfeld experiments with artistic people, uh, such as students of the Juilliard School of Arts in New York City. And um, what they found when they use artistic people is that they get higher success rates in some cases approaching 50-60% on the Gansfeld, um, whereas a success rate of about 25% will be expected by chance alone. So in the, f- the few experiments that I'm aware of where those with an artistic bent have been, uh, have been tested, they tend to get better success rates. But see, that makes sense to me. I'm glad you explained that part because... You know, my mind is well. They're getting you know a bunch of psychics in a room, and they're getting, in my opinion, less than stellar results. Like if I had someone call me up and say, "Well, 
I mean, and people ask me this, and I don't really answer, you know, how how accurate are you? And if I said, well, I'm 40% accurate, but <laughs> but the, you know, the guess rate is only 25%, so that makes me be pretty good. You know, I don't think I really have very many clients. But if you're talking about regular, everyday people, college students, that I think is very significant, and it really doesn't surprise me that someone that is more artistic, someone that gets more into the flow, is, can tend to be a little more internal with their energy, would have a much higher rate statistically. So mm. that's my opinion. Okay. Anyway, um, are you familiar with um, Lynn McTaggart's work? I've heard the name. Is he a remote viewer? No, it's a she one. Okay. No, she wrote um, a book called The Field, and she was doing a lot of experiments. Well, actually, um, not as much about psychic phenomena, but a topic that you talk about in your book is the psychokinesis. Right. Um, which I do want to talk about, um, where she would have like these marbles fall through this machine, and they would... It would instead of giving you a nice bell curve, it would be statistically over to one side versus to the other side. Um, anyway, I don't know why I brought that up. And cancel that idea. Um, but let's talk about psychokinesis. I mean, what is psychokinesis? Well, it's uh, it's the influence of. Um it's the influence on physical objects without the use of our muscles. So it's essentially it's the alleged ability of the mind to influence the movement of objects or some physical uh, phenomenon. So moving things with your mind. Well, yes, and, yes, and no. Um, I also talk about something called micropsychokinesis, which has to do with the apparent ability of the human mind to influence um, the results of observations and experiments in quantum mechanics, which is something a little different. Yeah, let's come back to that one because that one's kind of interesting. I always, you know, the whole idea of psychokinesis just really fascinates me because I can't even imagine how someone could make something move, like project their energy. I'm not even sure what they're doing to move something. I mean, I remember seeing, you know, the old films of the Russians, you know, doing experiments and the matchbook is moving all around the table and they're rolling ping pong balls around. And I can't even imagine how that happened. I mean, in your research, have you, has, has there been any science or studies as to how it is even possible to move things without touching them? Well, in Chapter 5, um, I discuss psychokinesis, and I only devote three pages to what's called macro-psychokinesis, which, as you say, is the movement of large-scale objects that we can observe. Um, this is a very poorly researched area of, uh, of parapsychology, um, I mentioned some impressive stories about Daniel Douglas Hume, um, the Scottish medium, how he could apparently move tables, make rooms shake, and so forth. Um, but today, by far, most research is done with far less impressive sorts of phenomena, uh, the so-called micro-PK, which are really small-scale effects that are detectable only with statistical analysis. So I know that's a lot less dramatic, but that's where most of the research has been done. But so, I can see, I mean, I can see where on a micro level it would be easier to influence and manipulate something, right. yeah. you know, versus uh, moving a table around. Um, <laughs> I think that would be pretty kind of fun to do. I mean, nice parlor trick. Anyway. Anyway, um, in your in in this area, you know, one of the things that has come out of um, the military, you know, is the concept of remote viewing. Right. How does that fall into the whole area of psychic phenomena? There's essentially four categories 
of psychic phenomena, there's uh, broadly we can we can divide them into two categories: extrasensory perception, which would be telepathy, clairvoyance, and precognition, and then psychokinesis. So what you just described is remote viewing. It's also called clairvoyance, which is French for uh, clear vision. And um, that's the alleged ability to view some distant location without actually being there. In other words, without actually using the eyes. And, uh, yeah, I think there's been some research into this, into the Army. Um, uh, The Army was looking at this in order to do things like... uh, find out what the Russians were doing at a particular site or to locate a down plane or to try and locate uh, the location of a kidnapped um, army officer. So, yeah, it's an aspect of extrasensory perception. I just think that it's interesting because that program actually went on for quite a number of years. Um, And if it was so unsuccessful, why... You know, if it was an unsuccessful program, why did it last so long? Right. You know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, kind of. Well, it really didn't work. Well, you could also ask why was it why was it eventually canceled? Um, the army and the CIA eventually concluded that although these abilities are real, they're not reliable enough to be um, <clears throat> to be used on a consistent basis. In other words, they thought there was something going on, they got some impressive results, but they weren't impressed with the consistency of the successful results. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's talk about the skeptics. I mean, you, you talked about them briefly. I mean, I just, I guess I don't understand what part they they feel skeptical about. I, it's, it's my belief, and let me just put out my belief. My belief is that everyone has psychic abilities of one kind or another. You know, I think everyone has the ability of clairvoyance and the ability of telepathy. I mean, the PK part, you know, maybe on microscopic levels. I don't know. I haven't been able to measure it. I haven't moved any tables. I don't know anybody. Well, I don't want to say I don't know anybody that has moved hasn't moved tables, but I do. So cancel that. Um, but I feel like if someone understands what the psychic phenomena actually is, you know, like knowing who's calling you on the phone, then how? I, I don't understand how they can say, oh well, it, it doesn't really happen. I mean, how do they invalidate it? Well, as I said before, for the most part, they ignore the evidence. When they can't ignore it, they try to dismiss it. Um, You have to remember that these so-called skeptics view themselves as guardians of rationality who must at all costs discredit any backsliding into religious fanaticism or superstition. Now, genuine, genuine skepticism plays an important role in science. New claims in science must be subjected to the most severe critical scrutiny if we are to minimize our chances of mistakenly accepting false claims. But uh, genuine skepticism involves the practice of doubt, not the practice of denial. And so most of these so-called skeptics are not true skeptics. They're merely deniers. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I have been faced personally with a number of people that say, well, they don't have psychic abilities, and th- but once they understand what the phenomena actually is, they quickly realize that they have had these experiences for their whole lives, and they just write them off to circumstances or, you know, coincidence or whatever. Um, anyway, but... Organizations that are skeptical in that way, what kind of influence do they end up having on public opinion? Their major goal since they were founded in the 1970s was to influence the media and through the media public opinion. A fellow in England named uh, Guy Lyon Playfair, he wrote an article recently called Has Psychop Lost the Thirty Years' War? And 
on the 30th anniversary of Psychop, they did a study of college students. What they wanted to do was test their hypothesis that there was a negative correlation between the amount of education a person has and the likelihood that they would believe in psychic phenomena. In other words, they wanted to test the hypothesis that the more educated somebody was, the less likely they were to believe in telepathy and so forth. What they found was exactly the opposite. They found that students with higher levels of education, like graduate students as opposed to undergrads, expressed a uh, expressed a stronger belief in these forms of evidence, in these uh, sorts of phenomena. So um, it was uh, the results they got from their survey was exactly the opposite of what they expected to get. This, of course, filled them with a bit of dismay. Uh, but yeah, that's why he called his uh, article "Has Psychop Lost the Thirty Years' War?" So I don't think they've been very successful. In the same breath, what do you, what impact on the belief in psychic abilities? You know, because if there's this group that is trying to discredit them, um, you know, what about shows on TV like Ghost Hunter or Ghost Whisperer or Medium or you know that actually support the notion of ghosts and psychic abilities and, and that kind of phenomena. Uh, I'm sorry, what's the, what was the question? You know, if there is this group that is trying to downplay and influence public opinion that these abilities don't exist, you know, in the same breath, they're competing against uh, TV shows, you know, like... Uh, medium or ghost whisperer or ghost hunter that are heavily in you know invested i mean the whole show is about delving into these unseen unnatural phenomena um, yeah i'm not i'm not sure i call these things unnatural well i that was in quotation marks oh okay okay <laughs> i didn't i didn't hear the quotation marks sorry <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I made them in the air. Come on. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, I, I, but do you think that that shows like that are affecting public opinion? You know, and overriding the negative influence. I wouldn't say they're affecting public opinion as so, so much as reflecting public opinion. I mean, what's on TV is, let's face it, what people want to see. If people don't want to see it, then the show has poor ratings and they're taken off. But a lot of these uh, these so-called skeptics, they actually consider television shows like the ones you mentioned to be uh, a danger to society <laughs> in the same sense that they think that uh, a belief in, uh, in psychic abilities such as telepathy is a danger to society. But again, I think it's important to remember that these people are a small minority of the educated public. And they're actually a small minority of... Uh, of the scientific community. Um, I mentioned those two surveys. I, here's, a, here's a brief excerpt, brief quote from Science and Psychic Phenomena. Uh, and I wrote, many mainstream, society, so, many mainstream scientists do not hold the opinion that such phenomena are scientifically impossible. Two surveys of over 500 scientists in one case and over 1,000 in another were made in the 1970s. Both surveys found that the majority of respondents considered extrasensory perception an established fact or a likely possibility, 56% in one and 67% in the other. Hmm. So most, most scientists, most working scientists are not, uh, um, shall we say, skeptical of the existence of these phenomena. Okay, so you made a statement um, about the skeptics where they think that these abilities are a danger to society. Mm. How, how are they a danger? I mean, what, what, what are the, <laughs> I don't even know what to ask. Um, I, I don't understand what their view, you know, of the imposing danger would be if you have these abilities. Well, it's not so much that they're opposed to the to a belief in telepathy because they somehow fear telepathy. It goes deeper than that. As I said before, most of the uh, so-called skeptics are militant atheists. 
you know, more secular humanists. And this is part of an ideology that uh, is anti-religious and anti-superstitious. What they really fear, more than anything else, in my opinion, is religion and the influence of religion, for whatever reason. Perhaps they were, uh, perhaps they were told that uh, they were going to burn in hell by their parents uh, because of their lifestyle or what have you. Um, some of them were religious fundamentalists when they were younger, such as Michael Shermer. Um, and remember, one of the major pillars of their opposition to religion and superstition is the ancient doctrine of materialism. Now, the doctrine of materialism is directly challenged by the existence of these abilities. Materialism started out as an ancient philosophy, which was thought to gain scientific support from the physics of Isaac Newton, because the physics of Isaac Newton is deterministic and materialistic. All causes are mechanistic, unlike modern physics, by the way. But, so it was thought, materialism was thought to gain scientific support from classical physics. Now, materialism as a scientific hypothesis makes a bold prediction. Abilities such as telepathy do not exist. If we find evidence, convincing evidence, that these abilities do exist, then materialism, as a scientific hypothesis, is proven false. And as I said, materialism is one of the pillars of their opposition. If materialism is proven false, then this pillar of their opposition to religion and superstition would crumble. And this terrifies them. This explains why they ignore, dismiss, and in some cases even suppress the evidence for psych psychic abilities such as telepathy or for the near-death experiences involving a genuine separation of the mind from the body. It's, be, it's really the implications of these facts that they fear, much more so, I think, than the facts themselves. The part I find really fascinating is that they, in, in how you're phrasing this, is that they have a correlation between this information and these abilities and religion. That Absolutely. if you have this ability, it's a religious, you know, it's a religious thing. But if you talk to anyone from a fundamentalist religion, you're burning in hell too, whether you have it or not. And, yeah. And, and what I find even more interesting is that my belief is that in time they're going to find that these abilities and these things happen, and I'm going to say on a quantum level, you know, it happens on some material, quote-unquote, <laughs> level that we just can't tap into yet. Well, one thing I often say when people use the word supernatural or paranormal is this. There's no such thing as a supernatural. There are only phenomena that we do not yet understand. So, if these abilities exist, they are part of nature. If spirits exist, they are part of nature. They are not somehow beyond nature. The distinction between the natural and the supernatural is really the, the distinction between the mechanistic and the non-mechanistic. It was thought, after the success of Newtonian physics, that all natural influences were mechanistic influences, similar to uh, uh, two gears uh, or... Um, two gears that are engaged, or uh, billiard balls on a table. But modern physics, which is quantum mechanics, allows non-mechanistic influences. So the distinction between the natural and the supernatural, or the normal and the paranormal, is really an anachronism, and it has no place in the modern world. And the other thing I'd like to say is this, is that you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the so-called skeptics, and you mentioned the religious fundamentalists. Well, it's a curious fact that extremists often have more in common with each other than they do with people who hold a more moderate position somewhere in the middle. I mean, it's the, the extreme communists and the extreme uh, fascists, uh, you know, in some ways they had more more in common with each other than, uh, than uh, modern-day liberals. But it seems like the thing that they're fighting against, you know, is a, it... Is the same thing that the other group is fighting against too over the same playing field. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I I do ghost hunting. I'm a psychic investigator for ghost hunting groups, and I'll share this story. So I was on doing actually a radio interview with a ghost hunting group 
radio show. Like the guys who had the radio show were ghost hunters. Okay? Mm. And um and their belief was that when you died, you went to heaven and anything that appeared on the earth were demons from hell. And so if you went into a house and they were having some kind of phenomena, it was a demon from hell. And that's how it needed to be addressed. And it's sounding like these atheists, you know, they want to attach themselves to this mechanist, mechan, me- Me- mechanistic. <laughs> mechanistic viewpoint because their only other belief is that it would come from hell, but they don't believe in hell. Hmm. Versus, you know, there's something in nature that supports this happening. I'm not sure that the most of the militant atheists think that the alternative is it comes from hell. I think the, they think that uh, these sorts of phenomena can't exist, and therefore, or should not exist, and therefore they cannot exist. I think that I, I don't think that most of them think too deeply on this level about this. I, uh, I think they just assume that a mechanistic worldview is is correct because somehow they think that science is based upon mechanism and materialism. And uh, so anything that challenges that has got to be somehow irrational. And I do think, and sometimes, and I, in my book, Science and Psychic Phenomena, I mention cases in which so-called skeptics have encountered good evidence for psychic phenomena. And what happens to them is that they experience this uncomfortable um, mental state that the psychi- psychologists refer to as cognitive dissonance which occurs when there's an inconsistency between what we see or hear or experience and what we believe. Now, there's there's a few ways of dealing with this inconsistency. One way, of course, is that you can change your opinions, change your preconceived ideas, more in line with the evidence. But because our ideas and our preconceptions are formed over the basis of a lifetime, um, due to our own unique experiences and education, upbringing, and so forth, opinions are often hard to change, especially when they have to do with religious or philosophical issues. So the other way of dealing with it is to simply dismiss the objectionable evidence. And, yeah, I've got something by Susan Blackmore. Um, she's quite... Let's see. Let's see if I can find it here. Yeah. Uh, This is in my chapter on psychokinesis. And she writes, quote, Human beings... Oh, I should, first of all, I suppose, tell your listeners, Susan Blackmore is a psychologist who started off as a fervent believer in telepathy and uh, psychokinesis, and also in other things, too, such as Ouija boards and so forth. She earned the first degree in parapsychology ever granted back in the 1970s, I believe. But... She wanted to be a famous parapsychologist. She basically considered herself a failure. And uh, at any rate, she became one of the world's leading critics of psychic phenomena and parapsychology. But uh, here's a quote from psychologist Susan Blackmore. Human beings are not built to have open minds. If they try to have open minds, they experience cognitive dissonance. Leon Festinger first used this term. He argued that people strive to make their beliefs and actions consistent, and when there is inconsistency, they experience this unpleasant state of cognitive dissonance, and they then use lots of ploys to reduce it. I have to admit that I have become rather familiar with some of them. First, there is premature closure. You can just pick one theory and stick to it against all odds. Or, the disbeliever can refuse to look at positive results. You may think I wouldn't refuse. But I have to admit, when the Journal of Parapsychology arrives with reports of Helmut Schmidt's positive findings on micro-psychokinesis, I begin to feel uncomfortable, and I'm quite apt to put it away to read tomorrow. So she just ignores it and doesn't look at it. Well, yeah, recently she's basically, she's basically given up. Um, on Chris being a critic of psychical research. You know, but then you hear stories, and it's an unrelated field of, you know, skeptics of UFOs, you know, and, and, you know, the whole alien phenomena, 
once they start investigating it and digging into it and looking at the reports and the, you know, and maybe have an experience of their own, they go from being skeptic to proponent. And it just, you know, in, in the same way, I mean, it's very hard for me to find that if someone was a skeptic of it, that, you know, my first, my knee jerk reaction would be, well, they have not looked into it at all. Mm hmm. So. Have there been any that have gone the other way where they started out as skeptics and in trying to prove those guys wrong um, actually became proponents of psychic phenomena? Yes, there was a psychologist, Elizabeth Meyer, and I wrote a review of her book, which was published. And I can't remember the name of her book right now, but uh, she, uh, she had an experience where an expensive harp was stolen and uh, someone suggested she contact a dowser who could tell her where the harp was over the phone. All she had to do was phone this fellow. So uh, sort of as a lark, she did call this guy, and he managed to locate where the, where the stolen harp was and it was recovered exactly where he said it was. This was done over the phone. I think he was in a different state when she called him. So this threw her into a state of cognitive dissonance because she thought that such phenomena should be impossible. Again, she was a psychologist, not a physicist. And um, she wrote an entire book about her confusion. And uh, eventually, unlike Blackmore, she talked to a physicist. And the physicist told her that, uh, that no, there's nothing in modern physics that prohibits the existence of abilities such as telepathy. Classical physics, yes. Modern physics, no. And this seemed to put her mind at ease. And uh, she came to the conclusion then that... Uh, there's nothing terribly um, supernatural about these abilities. Um, remember I said earlier, several surveys have shown that most scientists accept the reality of extrasensory perception. Um, one survey, for instance, showed that only 3% of natural scientists, that is, physicists, chemists, biologists, only 3% considered extrasensory perception impossible, compared to 34% of psychologists. And this is basically because most psychologists are not familiar with modern physics, which is quantum mechanics. And nothing in modern physics, as opposed to classical physics, would be compromised um, or contradicted by the existence of extrasensory perception. And see, and I find that very interesting um, coming out of the psychology field. I mean, for to a certain extent I can, you know, but there it just seems like that field you know, in the last 10 years has really been opening up and being more open or incorporating more uh, you know, energy medicine techniques, you know, going into the field of energy psychology and uh you know, hypnotherapy and 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 you know, bringing in more, I'm going to say, alternative healing techniques that are, you know, their foundation really comes out of the world of psychic phenomena. Right. Um, I think part of the problem is the name parapsychology. I mean, Rupert Sheldrake, who again wrote the forward to my book, he uh, has said that he would have no use for a field called parabiology. So it's really that name, too, parapsychology, which rubs them the wrong way. You have to remember that parapsychology only recently separated itself from philosophy. So, you know, perhaps many psychologists are a little uneasy about the scientific um, status of their own discipline. And so they don't want to be associated with anything that's flaky. And the name, the very name parapsychology is going to drive some of them away from the field and really uh, irritate them. And to be honest with you, short of talking to you, I have not heard someone really use that word okay in my intro of when i do a presentation of myself i've used that word since the 70s i didn't even know you could still get a degree in parapsychology i figured it had you know come up and dwindled away to nothing no para para there are parapsychologists working all over the world many of them don't have degrees in parapsychology what they have is degrees in physics or psychology engineering what have you dean radin for instance is done an awful lot of empirical research into these things. But most of us, uh, we don't like the name parapsychology. 
I prefer the name psychical research, which was the original um, term used to describe this field. Mm-hmm. But see, and I think a lot more people resonate with that. Like I said, the term parapsychology, you know, it was a pop word in the 70s. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. you know, and so today I think if you said, oh, well, you know, I'm studying parapsychology, people would just look at you weird. Well, they'd say, like, what are you going to do after you graduate? Like, work at Safeway or work at a su- supermarket? I mean, because they think that, uh, well, what are you gonna, how are you going to get a job with that? And unfortunately, uh, this is a poorly funded area of research. Uh, it's hard to get grants and so forth, partly due to the um, campaigns of ridicule that are launched by organizations such as PSYCOP or CSI. Mm-hmm. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like the parapsychology programs really focus on testing and measurement as opposed to technique or even a blending of testing and measurement and technique and so they kind of are a little you know it's a little one-sided in in Mm. what they're doing did that make sense i suppose uh if, if somebody was interested in becoming a professional um research psychic researcher I prefer that term to parapsychologist. Mm-hmm. I would suggest first getting a degree or two in, or three in physics. I think that's where most of the most most of the uh, really exciting work is being done. But another way, I mean, it wouldn't be the more scientific way. You know, having some training to be a psychic yourself would at least give you an understanding of what you're studying versus just studying some empirical data that you don't really even know what it is because you don't know what the experience is. You know, like someone that, you know, when they, when you uh, take horse, I don't want to say take horses, you know, but I just remember like in high school, you know, they would have the drug counselor come in and talk to our class about the ill effects of smoking marijuana. But then you get the guy talking, and it turned out he had been a junkie. And, you know, and their feeling was, you know, how can you sit there and have someone talk about it and understand what's going on if you haven't ever had the experience itself? And when talking in this area, it really is experiential. And so having the experience, I think, would help. A lot. Seeing a ghost helps a lot in your belief that ghosts exist, or seeing a UFO helps a lot <laughs> in your belief that, you know, that what you are investigating, I mean, I guess it takes you from being skeptical, you know, and kind of puts you in a different area. But anyway. Uh, I think, sort of. Um, I think that uh, that's probably true of people who start out with an open mind. I think that's much less true with people who start out with an extreme belief, extreme belief one way or the other. I mean, Susan Blackmore started off as uh, um, an extreme believer in astrology and telepathy and so forth, and then she performed a few sloppy experiments, didn't get, got what she thought were poor results, and went to the opposite extreme. Um, she became a critic, a fairly famous critic of parapsychology and psycho parapsychological research, but in my book, I describe how one day she was asked to witness a telepathy experiment involving children. This is what she wrote. We observed for some time, and the children did very well. They really seemed to be getting the right picture more often than chance would predict. I began to get excited, even frightened. Was this really ESP happening right in front of my eyes, or was there an alternative explanation? Somehow, I just couldn't accept that this was Psy. And I was to go through on. I was to go on arguing about the method used in future years. Was it just perversity? A refusal to accept my own failures? A deep fear of sigh? Whatever it was, it led me into constant confusion. I just didn't seem able to accept that other people could find sigh while I could not. So, you know, obviously she has, she was, she went from one fanatical position to another. And, uh, She's just somebody who um, seems uh, congenitally unable to tolerate uncertainty. But it also sounds like from the very end of that quote 
that she was unable to have a psi experience herself and was frustrated. <laughs> she was she was a she considered herself a failed parapsychologist. So she went to the opposite extreme and became a fairly successful, at least for a time, critic of parapsychology. That's how she made a name for herself. So, you know, on top of on top of uh, just the psychological aspect of holding an extreme belief, she also had a public position and a reputation to protect. Mm-hmm. So it's perhaps not surprising. Chris, the music is going to come up in a second. Thank you so much for coming on the show and talking to us about your new book, Science and Psychic Phenomena. You yes, are thanks for having loaded, me. Loaded with information, and I just really appreciate the factual... Uh, as opposed to a emotional explanation of what you see going on now and what has been going on in the past. Right, and if uh, any of your listeners are interested in learning more about my book, they can go to the book's website, which is the same title as the book, so it's www.scienceandpsychicphenomena.com. They can read endorse- They can read endorsements, they can read samples of the work, uh, and uh, yeah. Great. So I'm going to let you go. The music is running a little bit late, and the I'm going to get cut off here. So thank you, Chris, and um, I will talk to you soon, okay? Thank you, Rita. All right, bye-bye. And next week, we're going to have Dakara Keys on talking about relinquishing limitations. And in the second hour, we're going to have Sherry Richards talking about loving your unlovable self. So I guess it's going to be a week of health and healing where we can cleanse our soul and take our next step. So until next week, I'm Dr. Rita Louise. This is Just Energy Radio. Be blessed. Join host Dr. Rita Louise each week at this time for Just Energy Radio. Point your browser to www.justenergyradio.com for more show information and to contact Dr.